Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Future Frame TV. I'm Alice Crozer, your host for the Inequalities Channel. Equalities Channel is presented by Tracy James. I have the great pleasure today of being here with Sarah Kunz. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. We're very happy to have you. Sarah is the research fellow at the University of Bristol, uh, where she focuses her work on politics of migration categories, and there she specializes or focuses on the elite mobility part of these categories. We want to talk today about specific migration categories and what they have to do uh, with inequality. Sarah, can you tell us what these categories are so we kind of know that there are categories. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, of course. When we speak about migration categories, there's, of course, different types of categories, right? So you have um, political or legal categories, um, as you like. So every nation state that will have an immigration system will have certain legal categories that they go by. So there might be the category alien, or it might be the category immigrant, or, you know, a foreign resident. So these kind of categories. But then you also have just kind of sociocultural categories, if you like. So just the term, economic migrant or the term asylum seeker, which is a legal category, but also a category that we kind of use in everyday life. And these uses aren't always aligned. And then you have categories just such, such as the migrant itself, which is a migration category, gets used in very different ways. And so my research in particular focuses on the category expat or expatriate, which is, I think, quite a well-known term, but also a really contested term, which makes it really fun to research. <laughs> yeah, does that answer? Yeah, totally. But uh, can you tell us then what this expat means or, of or for you? Actually, that's a really good question. And it's a really interesting question. So because I started my research explicitly saying I'm not giving a definition of the term, I am researching the term. So expat is a very difficult category, if you like, or figure of migration, you can also say. It evokes many different feelings for people and it has many different meanings. So it is essentially a polysemic term, if you like. It has different meanings. So first of all, if we look at the category historically and the way it's been used historically, the term expatriate as a term to denote you know, a particular type of person has been around actively maybe for around 100 years, 150 years. Obviously, we can't really specify that exactly. But um, people started using the terminology of being an expatriate or of expatriating around that time. And originally, expatriation was associated with giving up your citizenship. So it was associated with either voluntarily giving up your citizenship and joining another nation, or having your citizenship revoked. And it wasn't necessarily a positive term back then, right? So as um, immigration systems were often highly gendered and uh, sexist in the past as, as in the present, but often, for example, a woman in some nation states like the US, if they married a citizen of a foreign state, of particular nation states, they would lose their citizenship immediately because it was assumed they would get their husband's citizenship. The same didn't apply for men. So these women might be expatriated, right? Fast forward in the 1920s, in the US, for example, the term was associated with Bohemians living in Paris, for example, the lost generation of writers, you know, Bohemians, artists, writers, they were living, for example, in France and Paris, and they were often regarded with a certain type of suspicion, because, you know, they were the kind of people that had left the United States, and why would you want to leave the United States? It was clearly the best country in the world, or at least that's why how many people saw it back then, right? So people that left the country permanently were seen as estranged and slightly suspicious. And the term also still had this connotation of exile. So people were expatriated, it meant that they were exiled, they were banished, they had to flee their country. So very different meanings to today's. And then fast forward to the 1960s and 70s, the term became more and more associated with business migration. So to send someone an expatriate assignment in business terms meant to send, for example, a manager, usually it was a high ranking staff member of a multinational corporation abroad for, you know, three to four years, usually on a really generous compensation package with their family. And those people became associated with the term expatriate. Nowadays, anyone really can call themselves an expatriate if you live abroad. So it's really quite a fluid term. But of course, we don't just call anyone expatriates. So that's where the politics come in, right? So to give a brief answer to your question, there really is not one meaning to the term. And I think researching the meanings of the term tells you a lot about the social history of migration and the way we've talked about different mobilities and the, the value we have assigned to different mobilities. So really, for me, the term 
or the, the term my expat or migrant, uh, they're interesting in and of themselves, but they're also interesting as a way into a kind of broader social history of migration, if that makes sense. Who then do we call expats and who do we call migrants? I mean, which one is which? <laughs> Well, again, it's hugely a contested topic, and it has a lot to do with histories of colonialism and racism, because as the story goes, it is often uh, white Western migrants that are called expats, not uh, exclusively so, one should say. But I think it's interesting before answering that question to look at the term migrant itself, right? Because expat is often recognized as a contested category. It's often uh, recognized as a label that people embrace, as an identity category, if you like. But migrant is often seen, or immigrant, is often seen as a kind of technical category, maybe even a neutral or objective category, right? We talk about migrants as if we all knew and agreed who migrants were, you know. So it's actually really interesting to know that there's no internationally agreed definition of migrant or immigrant. So if you look at the UN, the United Nations definition, which they recommend, anyone that moves abroad or changes their usual place of residence for at least six months, is a short-term immigrant. Anyone that changes their usual place of residence for at least 12 months is a long-term immigrant. And that can actually be within nation-state borders as well, right? But usually we talk about international migrants. So according to that definition, most people that call themselves expats would just technically be migrants, right? But then if we look, for example, at the, um, let's look at the UK context, because that's where I'm based. Migrant or immigrant are not legally defined terms here. So in, in legal terms, there are no migrants. There are, you know, foreign residents, there are, um, you know, naturalized citizens, there's all of these categories, but migrant is not a legally defined term. And if you look at the, you know, statistical measurements of migration, again, different surveys use different definitions, which is quite interesting. So you can measure migrants or you can define the migrant as a foreign born person. So someone that might have moved from Germany to the UK long ago and has naturalized and is now a British citizen, they might still be counted as a migrant because they were born somewhere else. Another way to define a migrant is to look at foreign citizenship, right? So if someone becomes a British citizen in that case, they cease to be a migrant. So different data sets or different surveys in the UK use different measures. So there is not one statistical measure of the migrant. The most widely cited statistics usually use the UN definition in the UK. So anyone that will change their usual place of residence and move to the UK for at least one year would be an immigrant in the UK. That includes international students, for example. It might also include a British citizen that has lived abroad for you know decades and moves back to the UK. They will be counted as an immigrant at that point, even though they're a British citizen, right? Which is really interesting. When people, academics, I should say, measure attitudes to immigration, the public's, you know, attitudes to migration, they often do not define the migrant they ask about. So a survey might ask someone on the street, you know, how do you feel about immigration? And then every person will have their own image in their head about who that immigrant is that they feel something about. And these don't usually correspond to the statistically measured immigration. And if you look at the way that these surveys are designed, and it's getting a little bit technical here, but a lot of them don't define that immigrant. So you're technically not measuring anything consistent. You're measuring everyone's idea, personal idea of who the migrant or the immigrant is, you know, that, that is coming to the UK. And when we look at people's predominant imagination of immigrants, you know, or the, the immigrants that are coming to the UK, usually the first thing they think about is not the international student, which is actually one of the biggest groups, you know, of, of immigrants. A lot of people will think about failed asylum seekers or illegal immigrants. And I'm putting this in quotation marks because they're quite derogative terms, actually, and they're not legal terms. Again, they're, they're kind of public figures, right? These are actually really, really tiny numbers um, in comparison to some of the other numbers of, of statistically measured immigration, right? So you can see it gets, it gets really messy. And depending on, on, you know, who you read or, you know, who you listen to, who you talk to, the immigrant or the migrant will mean something very different. What we also know from research across different European countries and the UK, people's imagination of, of immigrants or migrants are often racialized and they're classed, right? So when they think of a white German citizen living in the UK, the term they will think of is not usually necessarily immigrant, you know? So immigrants are often racialized as non-white. Around 100 years ago, the term immigrant was associated with uh, Jewish refugees fleeing Eastern Europe or Russia at that point and coming to the UK. 
In the post-World War II period, it was primarily, you know, people coming from the Caribbean to work in the UK. These were often citizens. You know, they were at that point pretty citizens. Um, they weren't necessarily, by all definitions, migrants, but they were seen as immigrants. Um, and more recently, people might think about, in the UK, might think about um, people coming from Poland, who, again, whether it's questionable whether they were migrants, it depends on the definition, because they were EU citizens and arrived as EU citizens until quite recently, right? So these kind of imaginations of who immigrants are, they're often classed also, because people will not necessarily think of, you know, your investment banker working in the city of London as an immigrant, when, you know, often they are. And they're racialized, sometimes they're gendered. So people will think about, when you, when you use the term labor migrant, people might think about men. When you think about health migration, you know, nurses, people might have an image of a woman. So there's a lot that goes into these constructions of categories. And it actually gets really, really messy when you, when you dig down and when you actually ask, so who is that immigrant or who's that migrant you're thinking about and who's that expat you're thinking about? And I think that it's really important in any case to, to kind of offer a contextual analysis, right? So the migrant or the immigrant that I think about, that I have in my head, will depend on the context of the conversation. It will depend on the context of where I'm currently based, which country I am in, what debates are going on in that country, right? It will depend on who I'm talking to. It will depend on what I do and, you know, what I do with my life and what I think about. <laughs> so all of these things matter. And also, if again, bringing it back to the measurement, depending on the country you're in, the country is going to measure migration differently. So really, it's really hard to compare uh, migration flows, for example, actually, when you, when you dig down to the depth of it. Before we come back to the category of expat, is there a possibility of not being a migrant anymore? Or does one stop being a migrant at some point? Or is it hereditary? Or after a certain number of years, you're not anymore? Or how, how does that work? Well, again, it depends on who you're speaking to and in what context, I would say. If you look at the measurement of migration, again, it depends on the, on the particular survey you're looking at. If you've got a survey that, you know, measures migration in terms of foreign born, then you'll never cease being a migrant, right? By definition, you can't change the place that you were born in. If the survey measures migration um, based on foreign nationality or citizenship, then you can cease to be a migrant. Of course, the question of dual citizenship then, then makes it a bit more complex again. So it maybe then depends on which citizenship you declare in the survey on, you know, whether you're migrant or not. If you, again, you know, look at political discourse in many countries, especially in Europe, it sometimes appears that some people will always be labeled migrants or descendants of migrants because they are seen as others to what the nation is imagined to be. Right. So the term migrant or second generation immigrant or third generation immigrant, again, is selectively applied to some people that are imagined as not belonging to the nation or the state. And the reason why they are not seen as belonging to the nation or the state often has less to do with their personal feelings of identification or who they are as a person. It often has to do with how they are racialized again, or the histories of, of you know, coming to the particular country we're talking about. And when you think about European countries, a lot of European countries, not all of them, were until quite recently empires, right, or imperial states. And as such, they had a very different imagination of where their borders went or who belonged to this imperial, you know, body of, of people, if you like. And so a lot of people that might have been counted as, um, you know, colonized populations just 60, 70 years ago, subsequently became immigrants and became seen as other. So speaking about, for example, uh, Caribbean people with Caribbean ancestry living in the UK nowadays, their grandparents might have arrived as citizens. And then over, you know, generations, the pretty state actively narrowed its conception of citizenship, its legal conception of citizenship. And that was a definitely a racialized process again. So people actually became stripped of their citizenship. Millions of people became stripped of their citizenship over time until we arrived at the latest rendition of, of British citizenship, which was in 1981, which was maybe the narrowest we have seen in the history. Um, so people became immigrants rather than you know, being immigrants and ceasing to be immigrants. It went the other way around. They became citizens, at least technically speaking, and then became immigrants over time. 
so it's it's quite counterintuitive, but it's quite interesting when you think about how these things can also happen, you know. <laughs> and it also goes a little bit in reverse with the expert category, right? Where uh, before yeah. it used to be somebody that was expelled and now it's yeah. somehow still connected to the home country, let's say, or a country of origin or something. Uh, but at the same time, it's also foreign in the place where they are yeah. now. So it becomes this kind of a double disconnected, but still with a certain connection to the place, right? How, can you say something more about this strange dynamic there? Yeah, it is very interesting. I mean, so the term expatriate, ex means out of, and patria means your country. So, you know, technically speaking, if you look at the roots of the word, it means being out of your country, or out of your native land. And you're right, the way that the term is used nowadays is often a kind of a permanent temporariness. So some people might have lived in their country of residence for decades and still call themselves expatriates because they still identify with the place where they've come from, right? And I think in reality, if, if someone has moved abroad, their identifications will be multiple. That's just how things are. You feel a certain relationship to where you've come from. You, of course, feel a relationship to where you live. You might feel a relationship to a third country or region where, you know, your partner is from or you've spent a significant amount of your time. So our relationships are always multiple in that sense or often multiple in that sense. But then these categories often ask us to, to decide, right, and to decide where we are from. And I think expatriate in that sense prioritizes the place where we are from, at least ostensibly. And often that comes with benefits. So if you think about an American citizen, U.S. American citizen, I should say, living in, um, well, Mexico, right? Their citizenship might bring a particular benefit or, you know, privilege, you might want to say, um, privilege of international mobility, privilege of status that might be associated with the U.S., privilege to be able to just move there and maybe, you know, work, these kind of things, right? So often when people who call themselves experts maybe stick to their identification, there's always, it's not that it's instrumental, you know, but prioritizing your relationship to where you've come from can bring certain privileges. At the same time, expat, even though ostensibly it's about where you've come from, it does define your relationship to the place where you're living, right? And it does keep you as another. And so many people don't want to be called expats either, right? Some people reject that term because they, they insist that they belong, right? So I've heard that much, uh, you know, quite often in my research where people are like, I'm not an expat, I belong here. You know, I am of this place. And whether this being off the place as being off the city. You know, I did research in Nairobi and many people were like, you know, I'm, I'm a local in Nairobi or off the neighborhood. People didn't want to be, you know, constantly the other and the foreigner. But then often being an expat foreigner means being a privileged foreigner. It means being a privileged migrant, if, if we're honest, right? So yes, there's an interesting dynamic around who is seen as temporary, but for what reasons again? So often people that are termed, you know, immigrants in places like the UK are seen as not belonging either, but on less privileged grounds. You know, they're seen as the other against which the nation is defined, if you like. They, they should integrate or go back where they come from, right? These kind of discourses. While expats are often um, also not integrating, if, if we want to use the term integration, which itself is quite, it's quite complicated and problematic. But if you want to use that term, often expats are not quote unquote, unquote integrated. But they gain, often gain certain privileges from not being so, right? Yeah, they're also not necessarily required to be integrated yeah. as part yeah. of, the, of the term. And maybe you can tell us a little more. You've done a lot of research on people that are internationally mobile uh, and not necessarily coming back to a, let's say, home country or permanent residence in a host country uh, with the transnational firms, uh, employees, high-level yeah. employees at transnational firms. Can you say something about the specificities of of this moving around when it's not necessarily anymore home and host country, but there is a whole range of countries and you yeah. might necessarily belong to a specific place. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I have done some research on Royal Dutch Shell, which is, um, as everyone will know, a multinational you know, corporation working in the uh, oil business and gas business. Royal Dutch Shell is really interesting because they have relied on so-called expatriate staff for at least a century. And they have consistently over the 20th century employed some of the largest number of expatriate staff of all multinationals. So they have always been seen as a forerunner in terms of the expatriate um, policies and that they, the way that they relied on an international workforce. And within Royal Dutch Shell, expatriate really was a company internal elite of employees. 
So those would be the, the highly skilled professionals, you know, engineers that have a particular skill set, management, you know, particular types of management, market and marketing, for example. So those were the company internal elite staff. And expatriates would be sent abroad to manage, for example, a subsidiary, right? So they were usually in the, in the top ranks of the subsidiary. And of course, originally, Royal Dutch Shell was an imperial you know, it was two imperial companies, actually, Royal Dutch and Shell. And when they merged in 1907, they became a multinational corporation, also in the sense that they were a British Dutch corporation. So they would primarily rely at that point on British and Dutch staff alongside, you know, maybe a couple of Swiss geologists and Americans to move around the world and manage subsidiaries everywhere. So you always had, as in the imperial and colonial project, more generally a thin white line, they called it, of, of you know, management in this case. And But at that point, it wasn't necessarily the case already that, you know, a Dutch manager would move to, let's say, Venezuela to work at the oil fields for three years and then come back to the headquarters. They might move from Venezuela to Mexico, then they'd move to Indonesia, then they'd move to, you know, Egypt. And at the end of, you know, 20 or 30 years of moving around, they might then move up in, in group central management. And that might mean going back to headquarters in the Netherlands or the UK. But for the most part, expatriates within Royal Dutch Shell, as within many other multinational corporations, if they were in that category of international staff, they would be sent around the globe constantly. And for them, so I've been reading memory documents, autobiographies, I've been reading stories, you know, poems, you know, these sort of literary documents produced by Shell wives, as they called themselves. So the wives of, of Shell managers, but also Shell managers themselves. And their primary identification often was with the company, right? So we often think that our primary identification of one of them at least has to be with a certain country. And to some extent, that was, of course, the case. You know, they were British or Dutch or whatever. But they lived in the Shell world. They lived under the Shell umbrella. And their, you know, primary identification was with other Shell staff, other Shell expatriate staff. They were Shell family. And in this case, the Shell family wasn't only the nuclear family. It was all of these kind of employees that were imagined as being, you know, part of the Shell family. And that actually had a purpose within the corporation. So the way Shell has always been an incredibly decentralized, you know, group of companies, actually, not just one company. We kind of actually have to conceptualize it as a group. So it must, you know, there was headquarters, two headquarters for the most part um, in The Hague and London. And then there was hundreds of, of operating companies around the globe. And the way that these corporations or companies or the group of companies was held together was by expatriates. So expatriates were sent primarily for technical purposes. You know, you needed a geologist and engineer. But besides that, primarily for control and coordination. So those are the two kind of, you know, traditional purposes for sending expatriates. So you'd always have an expatriate sitting at, you know, management level in any subsidiary. And you would rely on expatriates to know each other, to identify with each other, and to make decisions in harmony together. So by rotating people and their families, and by making them live in compounds, you know, the, the oil camp or the company town, and by essentially um, hindering integration into local places or identification with local places, you would create this cadre of really loyal company men, might be the technical term back in the day, that would identify primarily with the company and could be trusted also to make decisions in the interest of the corporation rather than in the interest of, of maybe countries that were gaining independence and might want to have more control over their own oil resources, right? So there was a company purpose, a corporate purpose in rotating people, thereby creating a particular form of identification, yes. And obviously this has, this has evolved since, right? So I'm, I'm kind of condensing hundred years of history into, you know, some tech lines here. But there's, of course, a lot more nuance to this. Um, but we still see this operating to some extent in, in the practices of multinational corporations sending around their staff. So if you think around today's expatriation policies in multinational firms, these policies, although they have diversified sense and there's been there's a lot of different assignment types now, they have an imperial genealogy to them. There's an imperial history to these policies. And I believe that we have to look at that history more closely and think about it a bit more closely if we want to understand what's going on 
at company level in corporations, but also more generally how inequality is being reproduced in the global economy, if you like. Yeah, yeah clearly there's a different uh, level of power attached to the different labels also that mm -hmm. the people that move get yeah. uh, put on, right? Or put on themselves. Yeah. Um, but before, I mean, this is a whole new topic that we'll get into the next uh, next episode that we'll do in uh, when you're done with your current research. Um, but before before we come to close, I'd like to ask you why you think this is uh, relevant, or what made you think it was a relevant idea to look at in the first place. Yes, I mean, there's there's the basic level of language. Language matters. The way we talk about things matters. The labels we use for people matters, right? And so when I started researching migration myself, or even when I started studying migration at university, you know, I was quite young and I studied in the Netherlands and then I studied in the US and then I studied in the UK and I studied migration in all of these places, but I hardly ever came across contemporary migrants in my research that, you know, looked like me, um, that were white and German. So often I realized that the migrations that I would be taught about, the migrations that we would study, you know, the people where we were trying to understand why are they moving abroad, you know, how can we better manage their migration, why aren't they integrating? These people were people from particular places, while the mobility, the global mobility, and mobility is already one of these terms that confers a certain status, you know, the mobility of Germans, at least the contemporary mobility of Germans, was never really questioned in the same way in my research. It was almost like, you know, of course, British people move around the globe. Like, we don't have to study that. That's normal. But, you know, when it came to other places, it was more like, why do these people move and how can we manage their migration? Because if, if their mobility is managed, then it's dangerous, potentially. And this kind of frameworks of thinking, again, have colonial histories. And there's a huge gender dimension to that as well, of course, you know, when throughout history, often women that were moving alone, and nowadays we might say they were the lead migrant or, you know, a labor migrant, they were often suspicious, you know, they, they might become corrupt, they were maybe loose women, you know, <laughs> these terms that might be used, they might be exploited. So migration systems have been set up in a way to facilitate the, the migration of men and to limit the migration of women, or at least constrain the migration of women and tie it to migration of men. So some of these ideas, of course, are quite old, but they, they become reproduced and often they become reproduced without us even realizing we're doing it. So mobility is, is a global good, if you like, that is very unevenly distributed. And for most people in the world, that is obvious by the passport they have, right? So I think if we think about inequality, in today's world that is, you know, globalized um, and has been globalized for, for much longer than we think about nowadays. But in a globalized world where money can move freely, goods can move freely more or less, but people are stuck to places or many people are stuck to places. Thinking about who's stuck and who can move on what terms is essential to thinking about and understanding inequality. And in that context, the way that we call people's mobility um, or the way that we frame it or label it is very important in discursively creating mobility or mobility as valuable or not so valuable, or creating some mobilities as maybe dangerous and others as normal, right? And that's where categories in English comes in for me. And that's why I think it's not the only thing we need to research, but it's definitely part of what we need to research. <laughs> Yeah. Sarah, thank you so much for these uh, very insightful uh, comments. <laughs> maybe next time we'll talk about migration. We'll think about the normality of who yes. we are talking about and uh, who we are feeling about and what we are feeling and talking about them. Really interesting subject also in terms of the privileges that uh, come with some categories and the lack of that comes with other categories. A lot more that we want to know, of course. Uh, if you're interested <laughs> in this research, uh, Sarah has a lot of uh, very interesting stuff published. Uh, you can find it on her website or in the internet, of course. Very <laughs> mobile. Yeah mobile information. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Sarah, for uh, joining us today. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was lovely and, to uh, you. It's uh, great to chat with you. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everybody, for watching this episode of Future Frame TV. Uh, I'm your host, Alice Crozer, for the Inequalities channel. And if you like this episode uh, or if you want to learn more about inequalities, please join us again next Saturday for another episode where we will look at any aspect related to this big topic of inequalities. Have a nice afternoon, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.